Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, all the people around the world, do my little road dog impression there. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Alex Cuesta Show. How is everybody doing on this Wednesday, April 27th of 2022? David, we did it. We're recording on a Wednesday again. We did it, Dave. We did it. It's a great thing. But before I introduce him, let everyone like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify and iTunes, spread this word of mouth, and go find us on the socials, The Alex Cuesta Show. Go search it on the newly free speech Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you want to go and find those. David, I already said hi to you, but I'm going to say again. How are you, dude? Tired. Pretty tired. Yeah. You Mainly working. working, working out and stuff kind of killed me for a bit, but I'll be all right for the rest of this recording. You kind of look like shit. Yeah, well, not that's great. Normal. That's normal. That's <laughs> normal. Has nothing to do with being tired. <laughs> so before we jumped into the topic at hand, because I am incorporating this into kind of like the daily ish so schedule, I'm going to continue with the Biden COVID tracker because it's necessary. I think David agrees that this vegetable of a human being that is our president, Joe Biden, deserves to be held accountable for all the COVID numbers that happened on his watch because. President Trump was held accountable. And now, obviously, no one has their big t- uh, tickers up and all that good jazz isn't going on. And we've had some pretty two days of semi significant bumps in the uh, cases. So you would think that the trackers would go right back up because we need to be aware and we need to know. But let's just go over real quick. Uh, yesterday, we were at 80,967,566 cases. Over for deaths, we were at 991,169. Today, the 27th, we are at 81 million. We cracked the, we cracked the 81 million number. 43,315. That's an uptick of 75,749 cases. And then in deaths, we are at 991,609. That's up 440 deaths. So Cases now for the second time in a row, we've been over 70K. Yesterday was 98,000. Today, 75,000. The deaths remain relatively low, um, under 1,000 yesterday. Today, clearly under 500. So again, I like to stress, we want to hold him accountable because he was the man with the plan that failed and he's failed miserably at everything in his presidency. But he's had, he's had no plan. And he needs to be held accountable. He needs to be reckoned with. And we are still sitting at an endemic calling it a pandemic so dave anything for you to say about these vid numbers the way the cases are like semi spiking they're still not at the level that we were seeing where they were like hundreds of thousands three hundred thousand here and there but it's creeping up more near the hundred thousand we're getting a little bit of a bump here any any opinions on the endemic that is coronavirus no i don't care about it <laughs> <laughs> i don't care for the sense that though i just i'm gonna do what the media and the journalists refuse to do and continue to hold this douchebag accountable. No, that's fair. I'm petty. <laughs> I'm just a petty little child. But we're going to get to the topic at hand today. Yesterday on The Daily Show, I did my own little mock draft. It was fun. 20 of the sports writers, draft gurus, I took their mock drafts, their most recent ones, scatter charted them on an Excel sheet did the averages for where they put all the guys. I had 53 guys that were qualified name wise, 33 were included in the actual um, mathematics of it all to make uh, rankings. And I got it done there and it was a cool way to do a mock draft going to test it up against what actually happens. But today, since me and David are tortured jets fans, we are going to talk specifically about what we would like to see as jets fans come out of the draft, specifically the first two picks, maybe. And we have, you know, what is the number? We have, oh, where am I? One, two, three, four, five picks in the first three rounds. So we are looking at a possibility for Joe Douglas to really set a solid foundation. If this team is going to be successful around Zach Wilson, having five picks in the first three rounds, whether he trades any of them or anything like that, but there's still a lot of, capital there to, in order to make major improvements to the roster five key players that play a lot that play big roles 
can completely and totally change around a team. That's a huge chunk of the 22 guys com- between the offense and defense that is going to be making an impact. So we definitely want, we're going to talk about that. Now I want to first go over the jets are have the number four pick in the draft. Um, Dave, I don't think there is no chatter about them being expected to trade this. Obviously Joe Douglas will listen to anything. If someone makes him an insane offer, he probably will take it, but there is no indication that they're looking to trade out of the four. Now, what have we seen throughout all Jets Twitter, Dave? We have seen anything but an offensive tackle, right? That's kind of like, that's kind of been the standpoint. Uh, I think Jets fans want to see what Makai Pacton can come back as. George Font was absolutely fantastic last year. So we're ready to roll with Font and Beckton. Um, and, and if you know if Beckton's terrible, we're going to take that chance. We're ready to roll with that. But so on my scatter chart, though, when it came down to it, the Jets at four were projected to take Evan Neal, offensive tackle from Alabama. Dave, how well would that go? No, it wouldn't go well. They come uh, up and they announce Evan Neal. It wouldn't go well. I mean, even just recently on Jets Twitter, I guess you can put it that way, uh, one of Jets reporters, Connor Hughes, is talking about how four seems to be between um, uh, Equanu and uh, Jermaine Johnson. And that even a, a, a Quanu, it does not make people happy. And he's supposed to be extremely good, but uh, we just don't want an offensive lineman at four. And that's for multiple reasons. And it's interesting you mentioned Jermaine Johnson because we're going to harken back to my scatter chart a good amount when you talk about these people. According to the 20 mock drafts I looked through and put the rankings in, he's slated here to go 13th to the Texans. So, potentially he's looking at a guy there. Now, what are they saying about, are they thinking that Thibodeau is going to be gone by the time they get to the four? Because if you're looking at the three teams ahead of the Jets, Jags, Lions, Texans, there's already three premier pass rushers there. And I don't think we expect the Texans to take a pass rusher because they have other needs to address. Um, There's Trayvon Walker from Georgia, who's projected to be better than um, Jermaine Johnson. Would you be happy if they went with Johnson or if it's the situation is Johnson, would you rather have him go with sauce Gardner? Honestly, I, I, I feel like at that point, a defensive pick is kind of fine with me either way. Uh, it is interesting seeing how at least through all the noise, Fibs has really fallen because what's the number four pick being Jermaine Johnson is not based off of Fibs being gone. It's actually based off of both Hutch and uh, Walker being gone. Yep. I mean, Hutch is supposed to be gone either way, but and so Walker's is gone. Walker, Walker yeah, but, in these yeah. in these uh, drafts mm-hmm. I did these little mock drafts. Sorry to cut you off, but no, it's fine. He had seven picks in these mock drafts as a number one ahead of Hutchinson. So something yeah. Walker did has made a lot of sports writers really like his game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's just like it seems like if those two are gone. Really, it seems like the Jets aren't as high on Thibs as some fans are, and they'd I'd rather go either Aquanu or Jermaine Johnson. And like, I mean, you asked about Sauce. I, I'd be fine with Sauce. I feel like it would give us, a, hopefully, a damn good corner. You can't always say coming out of the draft, no matter how high they are. But uh, it looks like a damn good corner, and really adding not only another one or two on our cornerback uh, depth chart, but it's just more depth. Cause honestly, if one of them gets injured right now, we're kind of reaching still. So that pick in itself wouldn't, I wouldn't hate that. But I mean, if we did end up going Jermaine Johnson, there's a part of me that feels like, okay, you kind of just want to trust what the scouts are seeing here and what they want for the team. Yeah. Um, being a Florida State fan, I love Jermaine Johnson. He's a reach at four. If you don't like what you see at four, if you're not going to go with Sauce, if you don't want Thibodeau, um, you know, if if both Walker and Hutch are gone, obviously I think they're going to be gone at that point. You don't want your fan base to rebel. You don't want to go with the tackle. No receivers that high for you. Trade out of that pick. Trade back. I'd be much safer if they traded back two or three spots and got Johnson two or three spots back because I don't think he is a number four guy. Now we got to remember too, that even though the money is an astronomical, like it used to be, there is a wage scale for where a guy is picked, how much that player deserves. So you'd be paying 
Johnson, who I don't think is necessarily a top 10 talent, top five money in a rookie. And again, it's not a huge chunk. They designed it that way, but it's still a good amount of money. It's still a, a, a big investment in a guy that at number four, he needs to be putting up Carl Lawson numbers. Year one, you're expecting him and Carl Lawson to be a two-headed monster. And I don't see Johnson. I see him being a guy that's very good, but I don't see him being a guy that's worth it at four. And again, if you're not sold on um, Stingley, if you're not sold on Sauce Gardner, and even if you don't want to pick Kyle Hamilton that high, because we still need a second safety. The Jets still need a second safety. And Kyle Hamilton's there, and he's arguably the most pro-ready guy in the whole draft outside of Aquanu. So... I don't know. I I don't know if Aquanu is going to be there because, again, arguably he's Quentin Nelson-esque is what they're projecting. So it's a difficult spot. Four is tricky. And it's, it's funny because, like, number one is easy. Number two is usually easy. Three is kind of the actual number one pick in most drafts is number three because usually they, you figure out one and two pretty quickly. But this draft is weird. Outside of Aiden Hutchinson – It's almost a crapshoot where everybody goes because I'm harkening back to my mock drafts again. I'm talking about Trayvon Walker like he's a given because between the 20 mock drafts, 13 of them had him going one or two, but he was also as low as eight. Two drafts had him going number eight. One draft had him going seven. You talk about Thibodeau slipping. One of the drafts had him going 13 all the way down to the Texans. There was also a number 10 going to the Jets, and he fell to the Jets at 10, and they were able to snag him there. Like like you said, the chatter and the smoke that is done pre-draft has affected Thibodeau. Now, I want to throw this. Dave, do you think there's some teams that are intentionally throwing out this smoke so they can get Thibodeau to drop to them type of deal? I feel like they really want him. I feel like that is a thing that happens. I don't know if that's specifically happening in this case, but I know that that is something that could definitely happen and it has happened in previous drafts. This case, I'm not certain, mainly because you have so many other good DNs, yeah, good pass rushers in this in this class. Mm-hmm. But I'm not certain. I, I don't know. This whole draft class is so up in the air. Honestly, I, I haven't really followed it as hard as i should because honestly it's 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 a lot more in depth than past ones it certainly is and like it's weird because if you look at it outside of aquanu and hutchinson there is no real maybe hamilton i think hamilton's going to be a surefire good player you don't really know and there's a lot of guys that are kind of equal in terms of their value so even when you get down to the jets 10th pick According to my numbers here, my crunches, it's Derek Stingley Jr. going to the Jets, which is arguably the second best corner in the whole entire draft. And people have been, uh, Sauce Gardner has risen above him lately. But in the beginning, even as long, even as little as a month ago, it was Stingley Jr. was a guy. And there were talks about Stingley Jr. going forward to the Jets. And he's gotten pushed back and he's now closer to 10. But then again, uh, this has been a spot where I think everyone in Jets world is expecting a receiver. I think everybody in Jets world is expecting a receiver at 10. If the pick is still there, because there is a lot of talks of the Jets, you know, uh, they, they apparently the report is they have a godfather deal in order to try and get Debo. Um, But interesting, Dave, I'm putting this to you because we're going to go by my scatter chart here, my little thing, and we're going to go off of that. According to this, the Seahawks take Garrett Wilson right before us. If something like that were to occur, if they go after a Garrett Wilson, if they go after a Drake London, a uh, Chris Alave, one of these big wide receivers, does that mean DK's pretty damn open and do Joe Douglas is burning his phone up to try and get him out of Seattle? Because I if would. you go with the number one guy like that with all the stress that DK had last year of really not connecting with Wilson, is that kind of spell red flags that you're going to try and explore if you're Joe Douglas? Hey, I don't know about that. I think that's more of just trying to get other good players on the Seahawks. Because honestly, right now the Seahawks are tumbling. They, they're not in a good spot. So they just need other good players. And if they feel like that's the best value they can get at that pick, that's probably what they're going to do. I'm not entirely sure what the Seahawks are thinking. I don't follow them enough. But... Honestly, they, they kind of need help everywhere with what's happening in that organization right now. 
I mean, they're they're so good at safety. <laughs> And on the man formerly in green at number 33. <laughs> Thanks for the great spot. Anyway, um, number 10, Dave, who do you want to see there? Uh, obviously, Derek Stingley seemed like he's going to be there. Garrett Wilson might still be there. I expect him to be gone earlier. I expect him to possibly go Falcons or Seahawks because I think Garrett Wilson has moved his head and shoulders above everybody else at wide receiver. But there's also Drake London, who... According to my little mock drafts, six mock drafts had him go into the Jets out of the 19 that he was included. And there was a full draft where they didn't include Drake London, which to to me, that should disqualify your mock draft. But the the six of them had him going there. You also have Jamison Williams from Alabama, who's really good. Chris Olave is there. Um, That's just a wide receiver group. What are you looking for in the number 10 slot from the Jets? Uh, a wide receiver, uh, honestly. It really, I feel like it should be a wide receiver unless you're going to go really defensively heavy in this draft and you have the opportunity to do it. Like you get the guys you really want on defense. But one of the best things to do in Zach Wilson's second season is to help him as much as possible. You went and got two good tight ends for him. That, that was genuinely a good pickup. And he agency. loved tight ends in BYU. Exactly. So, that, that was a great pickup in free agency, but one more good receiver in this receiver room would really be a big help because it's not the best receiver room right now. It really no. isn't. No. So getting another good one, even if it's a rookie, helps out. And I mean, honestly, it any of those names could really work. I know I've seen a lot of Jameson Williams hype recently on Jets Twitter just because how explosive of a playmaker he could be. He's a freak. Yeah. So... <laughs> Either way, I feel like if you do end up going wide receiver at 10, let's say uh, no trades happen. Let's say every trade that's been hyped up recently, nothing happens. If you go wide receiver at 10, I don't really think you get it entirely wrong with almost any of the names knowing what we know right now. Now, maybe in the future, you kind of look back on it and hindsight's 2020 and the receiver doesn't pan out. And you're like, oh, well, he should have noticed this. But most of the time, Showing people him. don't notice it, that at that time. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's the thing. I, I just feel a receiver at 10, whatever they see as the best for this fit right now, I'm hoping that they get it right. Yeah. And, you know, I trust Joe Douglas. When he had the full draft last year, it was very good. He had a very good full draft when he was kind of thrown in his lap. I don't count his first quote unquote draft because he was quite literally brought in a week before the draft and he had no idea any of the scouting guys like they were, that was a mess for him, but his full draft was very good. I'm expecting another good draft coming out of him. Now I'm going to pose this to you. Do you prefer the jets drafting a young wide receiver or would you prefer number 10 being sent for Debo or DK Metcalf? I would, I, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't even talk about DK anymore. I don't think DK is even in play right now. But the only one I would think is in play is Debo. Honestly. What about AJ Brown? There's no, I know they said they want to lock him up, but they haven't locked no, him up yet. That's not going to happen either. I mean, I guess with every possibility in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So but, I'll put it to you this way What's your preference? Trade for a known commodity wide receiver or draft one of these young, explosive kids where it looks like there's four guys at least that are going to be impact wide receivers? So to use the 10. I'm fine with getting a veteran wide receiver that put up very, the historic numbers, like damn good numbers, career numbers. Yeah. I'm fine with using a 10 for that because even with these playmaking wide receivers at 10, like I said, things could not pan out. And then your wide receiver room is bunk again. You get a veteran, things are most likely going to pan out with the veteran. Usually there's not that much of a fall off, even if there is a fall off. Yeah. So, that's the thing is it's like, if you can move the 10 for Debo, then move the 10 for Debo. And I'm certain that's what they're thinking, Yep. but I have no idea what's going on with those, those negotiations. So I just plan on it not happening, honestly. But if that's the thing you could do, you do it. You go get the proven commodity. It's honestly better in the, uh, in the, uh, the long run. And you already have a young, very good wide receiver in Elijah Moore. It's not like you need the future wide receiver. It'd be awesome to have two of them, but Elijah Moore damn damn well seems like he could be a number one. 
Certainly does. And, you know, and you have to think in fairly recent memory, the Jets have had a lot of success either bringing in free agent veteran wide receivers or trading for them between Eric Decker and Brandon Marshall or the most recent where they were 2000 yard wide receivers in the same season. We haven't had that in a ridiculous amount of time before that. Then even before him, Plaxico Burris was very good in the red zone, had over 10 touchdowns in the red zone for the Jets when he came on after shooting himself in the foot, quite literally. Um, then even before that, Braylon Edwards and Santonio Holmes were both guys brought in. So the Jets have had a lot of success bringing in wide receivers. And like you said, with the potential drop off, Braylon Edwards, there was no drop off. He came from the Browns and he excelled with the Jets. Santonio Holmes, before the Liz Frank injury, was definitely better with the Steelers, but was still good with the Jets. Um, I think Decker and Decker and Marshall are both very good. They love Fitzpatrick. So I think there is a good track record there for bringing in the veterans and having a huge impact right away. So I don't know. I, I'd probably prefer the trade. If you can get Debo, you get Debo. If you get Debo Samuel, you go get him. He was outside of Corderell Patterson, the most explosive uh, skilled player out there. I, th- I thought Corderell Patterson... I'm not going to say it was better than Debo because Debo is more talented, but Cordero Patterson meant more to the Falcons in terms of staying competitive because Debo at least had some talent. I get it. There was a ton of injuries on the Niners. He was asked to do everything, but Cordero Patterson, that was the starting unit that he was with and he still had to do everything. So it was kind of like, but they're similar players. Just Debo's a better version of him. But I just want Jets to pump their brakes. I don't think Debo wants to do any of that shit in New York. If he comes to New York, I think he wants to run routes and catch footballs. I don't think he wants to be the running back. I don't think he wants to do all this shit that he had to do in San Francisco because that was out of necessity. Yeah, that's the main thing that that tells me that he m- might not be coming at all mm-hmm. is the fact of the matter is that it. It's been reported that it's not a money issue in San Francisco. It's a use issue. He doesn't want to be used in that certain way. And it's the same kind of the system that we have over here. Now, the question is, if we were to pick him up, would we use him primarily as a wide receiver and use Elijah Moore more in those more in those running plays? Because Moore can do that as well. Not as yeah. well as Debo, but he can still do it. So I mean, there are ways that you could probably say, hey, Debo, we're not going to do that to you. I mean, maybe once or twice, but like not that much. Maybe you could do that. I have no idea. But if you already are leaving a system that you don't want to be in, most of the time you won't want to go to a system that is very similar to it. I don't think he would mind being a gadget, considering that, like you said, Elijah Moore could do it as well. Braxton Barrios is very good at doing it. So it wouldn't only be on him. I think his issue was there was no surprise in San Francisco anymore. He would line up as an H back. It wasn't like he was always going in a motion. Like he doesn't want to just be the only weapon. I think on the jets, he knows he wouldn't be the only weapon for San Francisco for a time. It was only Debo. There was no one else that was threatening it. Kittle Kittle was hobbling towards the end of the season. He was toughing it out, but he was hobbling. And the running back room was decimated. So I just think Debo just does not want to be the only guy that they know is going to get the football. So it'll be interesting. I would like to see him there. But out of the young wide receivers, Drake London really intrigues me out of USC. I know, like you said, there was a lot of noise coming from Jamison Williams from Alabama. And it's tough to deny Alabama wide receivers after the last crop that we've seen between uh, you know, Amari Cooper, C.D. Lamb, all of these guys that have just been unbelievably explosive. But I don't know. I like the LSU kid. I think, I think Drake London can do kind of Corey Davis better than Corey Davis, and we have Elijah Moore who can blow the top off of it. So it'll be fun and interesting. So that's kind of our first round. Um, so here's the deal. I saw a few drafts I had the Jets trading back in later. Do you think the Jets use some of their second round capital, maybe their first, their, their 35 and 38 that they have there to get back into the first round and grab somebody late? Because there's a lot of value in this draft in the first they round. Could, they could do that if they actually do love someone. I didn't want to make a minor correction. Drake London is from USC. You said LSU. Um, oh, did I? You, I'm looking at it too. USC. No, you, oh. you might have been looking at Derek Stingley. That's the thing. <laughs> so, Probably. They're, they're like two spots away from each other. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, no issue. Uh, but yeah, I, they could definitely do that. I don't know if they're going to do that because they do like their second round picks. Uh, so we'll see. 
We'll see how that works out. I don't know. It gets tough when it gets to that point, and especially with trades. Because, uh, I mean, Joe Douglas didn't move up for AVT, and I, th- I thought it was a great move because yeah. AVT is a fantastic guard, at least rookie season. So we'll see what happens. If they really do love someone at the end of the first round, then I could see them doing it. But I don't know if they do love anyone that much. The most we've heard from them is that they have 10 guys that they really like. Which means that which means that they kind of set themselves up yeah. to pick four and ten. Hopefully they're being as honest as they are, they can be about that. But as far as I know, they have ten guys they really like. So I don't see them moving in unless someone really slides down. Like I mean, really falls. So what are the possibility? Do you think that there's a chance that Joe Douglas pulls the trigger to try and trade the four and an asshole of stuff to jump into two and grab a Trayvon Walker. Or if something like Ike McQuanu goes one, because I've seen a few drafts where they had, uh, there were two drafts that had Ike McQuanu going one to the Jags, which if you think about it, it's not a terrible move. Trevor Lawrence got his fucking ass beat all year. So there is the possibility with, you get the surefire potential hall of fame tackle. Uh, you know, you put that guy there, that foundation left tackle. If something like that happens, could you see Joe Douglas trying to jump to the three or two to maybe grab a Walker or Hutchinson or at least guarantee one of the two? It would be a King's ransom from the four. He'd have to do a ton of picks to get there. Yeah, I don't I don't know about that one. Like I said, if they are serious about loving 10 guys and having 10 guys that they could pick, then that means that they won't move from at least that spot. Other spots up in the air. But the four, I feel like they're not going to try to move from there at all. I feel like they don't they don't seem to be that desperate for someone in order to move one or two picks. It seems that way. It seems and Joe Douglas, I don't take Joe Douglas as a desperate type of guy. He never he seems like he's a guy that has a plan at all times Mm -hmm. and he has a plan A to Z. In mm-hmm. every single situation. So mm-hmm. I don't think he's a guy that's ever really caught off guard, which is nice to finally have somebody like that uh, running the show. So I do think that he's not going to be in panic mode, whatever happens. I think he might be in excitement mode. I think he was, you know, absolutely giddy to be able to get ABT last year. I think like get, being able to make that trade made him happy, but I never see him as a guy that isn't prepared. And any Eagles fans listening, if you agree, back that up. Because I know you guys love Joe Douglas over in Philly and you were sad to see him come to the Jets. I, we have Philly fan friends that are constantly saying, like, trust the bald boy. Like, we love him. He built our Super Bowl team. Like, trust that guy. Um, let's talk, Dave, the number 35 pick in the second round. So, right here, this to me, Dave is where I'd either want them to go offensive tackle or where I'd like them to go safety. Cause I think those are both things of need because I don't, I don't know about corners this late. If you didn't address it up top, if you didn't grab Stingley, if you didn't grab uh, sauce Gardner, then you might be a little remiss because you have guys down here. You have Laura sign of Georgia um, played a big role in winning for Georgia. You have Tyler Smith, um, offensive tackle from Tulsa, who has been projected. He's a potential first round guy. All these guys I'm talking about, they're at the bottom of my list and were included in some mock drafts, but they just never didn't have enough clap to get in. But they were they're skilled guys that still have a chance to climb in. Uh, what would you want to see addressed, even at 35 and 38? Would you would you like to see them address one of the three that they missed up top from the two, or would you kind of want to see them switch gears if they get into the second round? I. I don't – if they miss one on the first two, I feel like they do it on purpose because someone was taken that they really wanted and then they don't want to reach for that position in the second round. So I do feel like they'll switch gears. Now, where it would be, I'm not entirely sure. Personally, I feel like mm, you get to tackle a little later so the 38, the 38, if you're going to go that way, it's more of a depth piece. Yep. But I feel like you're either going safety or, I don't know, to me, I feel like another linebacker wouldn't be bad. I know the Jets love their linebacking room, but 
I feel like another good linebacker, a second round linebacker would not be a bad choice. What about another defensive end? Because the depth at defensive end in this draft is absolutely unbelievable. What about even if they get Thibodeau, even if they uh, figure out a way to grab a defensive end, what about grabbing another one and putting in competition or just hedging in case Lawson's injury peaks its head back in? I would do that later. I wouldn't do that second round. Do that. Wouldn't do that second round. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our second round addressing third round. Only a one pick um, in the 69 third round. Nice. It's it's a fifth pick. Yep. The fifth pick there. 69. Yeah. You're gross. Um, (laughs) What do you want to see them do in third round? Uh, Where do you think is this kind of, because the first three rounds are potential starters. So would you like to see them maybe round out running back because they have Michael Carter Tevin Coleman. I don't know if we can rely on Tevin Coleman. I don't know if they brought back Tyler Johnson. I don't know that situation. Is this where you pick a shifty running back? Because there were no running backs in the first round that I saw. Maybe two popped up on mock drafts. Second round is probably going to be littered with them. And I don't know if you want to reach for a potential starter. Because I don't know if that's worth it. Because you have Michael Carter. Third round, do you want to maybe see him get a little more depth in that running back room and get them uh, something going there? Do they go running back or deep tackle? Uh, we don't have, we, we just lost out on Fado Kasi. He's yep. gone. He's gone to the Jaguars. So now we still need, a, uh, we need some type of big boy in the middle. Uh, and I, not a bad thing to go and grab a rookie that could possibly be good in the middle. So uh, it's either you grab a D tackle or a running back's not a bad choice, really, because I mean, third round running backs can be very good. I, if I remember correctly, I think, I think Mike Carter was a third round running back. I might be wrong though. Maybe your second or third round, one of them, but second he was one of, one of those two. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, there's a good chance that you can get a nice guy. Now, after this, I kind of call the other groups here diamonds in the rough, but the Jets have a pretty concise draft. They have two picks in the fourth, two picks in the fifth, and then they're done. They have no six or seven. So they have a chance to get all impact guys. Cause even fourth and fifth, you're looking at depth players, not practice players. You're looking at good depth players, maybe some talented special teamers. Um, what are just other positions of need? Would you like to see? You mentioned linebacker. I think you could definitely go linebacker again. Uh, try and get some help there. Um, what would you say to possibly late in the fifth, grabbing maybe another quarterback and seeing what's going on? We have a Hall of Famer and Mike White sitting behind Zach Wilson. We have the most elite quarterback of all time and Joe Flacco sitting behind Zach Wilson. Would you like to replace either of those guys or either push either of those guys with a potential rookie and go the Belichick route of always kind of draft a QB and see what happens? No, nah, there's no reason. Uh, there's just no reason. I feel like that's wasting a pick at that point, even though fourth and fifth, you might not see them almost ever, but I'd still feel like that's wasting a pick, especially because like you mentioned, they could just become good special teamers, which is not a bad thing. It's a yeah. very good thing. So I feel like at that point, you kind of address depth. Uh, mainly, you said linebacker, you could do that. But skill positions, lots of skill positions. Or if you like alignment enough, you get him. But for me, it's mainly skill positions at that point. How comfortable are you a kicker? They have Eddie Pinheiro. I think they signed another veteran. I forget who Zerloin. it was. Who? But if I'm correct, correctly, Zerloin. Zerloin. They signed Greg Zerloin. How comfortable are you a kicker? Pinheiro was, a, was just a good kicker last year. He wasn't terrible. He did his job when he came in, righted the ship. Um, Zerloin has definitely lost some. That's why he was cut. So we don't know. Do you roll the dice in the fifth round or or even maybe when, you know, kickers are going to start coming off the board, just grab the best one in that fourth, fifth round, just grab them, try and shore up because how many times last year could the Jets have potentially won if a kick or two was made and we lost games by six points here, three points there, uh, Kickers really make a difference still in the NFL. A good kicker makes a huge difference. Do you think that there is a chance that if they get what they need in the first three rounds, they're looking at the fourth round going, let's get the best kicker, fifth round or whatever. Let's get, because they don't have a six, seven. Or do they kind of trade one of these picks, get a bunch of picks late? And then, because I think they got to bring someone in. They got to bring a rookie in to challenge these two guys and maybe shore up that kicking room. I don't don't feel like our roster is great enough 
in order to go and pick up a rookie kicker, especially when you have two on the roster right now. You have Eddie Pinheiro, who did just, just fine rounding out the year, and you brought in a veteran to make it a kicking competition. Listen, we've had kicking woes. We might continue. I don't know. We'll see how Pinheiro does, because right now he's a starter for me. He's the one that we ended with last year. He did fine last year, at least to end it. So if the, the roster is not that good. It really isn't that good. So why would you even waste a pick on a kicker unless it's seventh round? Unless it's for me, late. it's because that's less pressure on Zach Wilson. Because that's less pressure on Zach Wilson to try and finish every single drive with the touchdown. Because he knows that okay, this one stalled. Let's go get the automatic three and get it'll, back to it. It'll or be we can less win a game late. It'll be less pressure on Zach Wilson getting him offensive weapons than it is to get a kicker, a rookie kicker. <laughs> it's that simple. So that's know. not even a question. To me. I've it noticed really the is. value of kicker. If we had a single kicker, <laughs> if we had one kicker who wasn't, who is only slightly above average, then I get it. We have two kickers on the roster. If you put a draft pick on a kicker with the roster that we have, there is no damn reason for that. That alone is a detriment on your draft. <laughs> hey, listen, we could get Mike Nugent again. And him be terrible. Uh, all right. So ultimately, Dave, are you thinking that I'm thinking that this draft can have a huge impact? And at, with the number of picks that they have, that it's all first five rounds, um, five picks within the first three rounds. If Joe Douglas hits on this draft, this could be massive. For the Jets, we've seen Bill Parcells, when he came in, had a few huge drafts, changed the whole thing around. Um, then you had later years between DeBrickishaw Ferguson and Nick Mangold coming in, in a few drafts amongst each other, changed the whole culture. I feel like this could be not only a talent changing, but a culture change in the roster where you have, and you have guys like CJ Mosley, who's already all about that and is going to ingrain this type of stuff. You have a no nonsense guy like Carl Lawson, who's going to ingrain this type of shit in people's heads where be here, work hard. And is this make or break for you right here? If we're going to be set back another 10, 15 years, if this draft fucking sucks, I want to say 10, 15 years, but this is a prove it year for Joe Douglas and Robert Sala. And especially, especially, uh, if he picks up a tackle at four, that to me, I've told you this before, but that to me signals that you, one of your first big draft picks was a miss. Because honestly, I don't think you're getting rid of Fant. I really don't with the way he played last year. And so that tells me that you don't believe in Mekhi Becton. And listen, if it really is that way and you make that choice and it works out, that's okay. But that's not a good start. <laughs> it's not a good start to the draft that that's what you're signaling. So that's why that's also partially why I hope it's not a four, uh, not an attack at four, no matter how good he is, because our offensive line should be fine. It should be okay. We, we've got the guys that we should want. So if we were to do that, it's signaling something that's not right there. And so that's why it's, it's really a prove it year for JD. You really need to make sure this draft does well. Because we don't want to see another QB fumble around and us feel like we ruined his career. We don't want to see this team win only three, four games again. It's just not something that we want to see. We want to see very good competitive play. Not incredible competitive play. It doesn't have to be amazing. But we want to see some damn good play. And we really do want to see a wild card berth, honestly. Especially when now it's extended. Now, now it's extended. You, there's more teams getting into the playoffs. So we really do want to see a wild card berth, at least fighting for it. We yeah. don't want to come out of first month of football saying, oh, well, there's next year. Yeah, if they do go tackle it for it, has to be if a quantu is there. It has to be a quantu. I wouldn't be happy with you. At least a quantu, mm-hmm. you could say, listen, we don't believe in McCoy, but Makai, he's hurt. We're going to get rid of him, but we have this guy. Makai was never meant to be generational. This guy is, sorry, Jesus Christmas. This guy is as surefire as you're going to see. So I don't want Evan Neal. Evan Neal has question marks. You yeah. don't bring it, you don't get rid of Makai Becton for another guy with question marks. You roll with Makai and let him get better and see if he can figure it out. So that to me, again, I would agree to you unless it is a Quanu. If it's a Quanu, you can at least swallow that salt and live to fight another day and sit there and be like, mm, that hurts. 
but at least Zach Wilson has a foundation bedrock and, guy. And then 10 has to be a good pick. 10 has to be. A, and well, a, honestly, you know, it makes me feel like if you're, if you do tackle at four, you almost have to double down for offense. And honestly, you almost have to double down and say, Hey, we're going to go get a damn good wide receiver at 10 and then worry about like defense for the rest of the draft for the most part. Cause yeah. uh, for me, like, that's basically what you got to do because al- almost every other defensive player that you would probably want other than Stingley would be gone at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Hamilton will surefire be gone. Sauce Gardner will be gone. All the, ta- all the DNs will be gone. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of don't have a choice. You need to go wide receiver there. Yeah. So that, that's going to be, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a chess game. Um, are you expecting Douglas to make any trades? Big trades, not just little ones. No. late. Big not trade. big ones. Not no big, big ones. ones. No big impact I don't, trades. The only big trade would be a trade for Debo, and I just okay. don't see it. At least All not right. right now. Last question before we close out. On a scale of one to confident, how confident that JD is going to have a great draft? I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident. It's the problem with the yet again, a problem with this one is so up in the air, you have no entire no certainty on what the hell is going to happen, but I'm pretty confident that he's going to have a great draft. Cause why not? I mean, it's, it's better than being hopeless. It's it's because I don't have a reason to be hopeless for JD. It's not like he's completely screwed up the franchise or anything. So why not just be confident? He has made some damn good choices. The free agency hasn't been bad for us. So why not be okay with him going through this trap now draft night? Maybe I won't be so happy, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm confident because, you know, the guy was director of scouting in Philly, built a Super Bowl team, and he definitely not only knew what he was looking at himself, but he certainly poached some guys or got guys in the vein of the people that he surrounded himself with in Philly. So he has to have a good scouting unit. And I loved watching one's Jets drive and seeing the head scouts talking and things like that. They know they're on the same page. You could see that the Jets franchise right now is on the same page. Joe Douglas is and Robert Sala together are running a ship that has one direction, one goal, one site. There's no competition between head coach and GM. And that's a great thing to start. You need that. Either the head coach is the GM, so there's no competition, or the head coach and GM work in sync. If they don't work in sync, then you have the Detroit Lions or what the Browns were for so many years or what the Jets were for so many years with Idzik and Tannenbaum towards the end and things like that. And McCagnin, where it's an ego versus the coach. And you don't want that. So I'm confident in the sense that he's making decisions based on not only his scouts, but on what the whole team, including Robert Sala, wants. Mm -hmm. It's not, I'm giving you the guy you work with it. It's Rob, what do we want to do together? Yeah. So let's pick guys that are going to work with your group. What does um, LaFleur need? What does, what does everybody need? What are we going to do? How do they fit into your system? Mm -hmm. So I feel like that is there. And that gives me supreme confidence in that he's going to make the best pick possible. Cause not only does he know what he's doing, this whole unit seems to be working together. So this recipe for success from the front office to the coaching is there. Now it just has to be put on the field. We need to get Wilson weapons. I certainly want to see a wide receiver, maybe a second one later. And I do want to see a running back in this draft. Mm -hmm. Um, And another thing that I do want to see, Zach Wilson needs to throw the ball 30 to 40 times next year. If he's not throwing the ball each game 30 to 40 times, even on bad games, you never see elite quarterbacks. You don't see Joe Burrow having a bad game in his first 15 passes and finishing with 27. No, he has a bad game with 15 passes. He finishes with 53 because he works through it. And that's Justin Herbert. That's all the young guys. That's Allen. That is even Tua to an extent threw the ball a good amount last year. And Tua sucks. And I'm not going to say Wilson's great. Wilson sucked. But you got to let these guys, now that he's in his second year, if you're going to hand him the playbook, you can't Sanchez him. You can't Geno Smith this guy. You can't Sam Darnold him. Throw the ball. Because if he's bad, Throwing the ball 30, 40 times a game will tell you he's bad. If there are things he can't fix and can't get better, you'll see he can't get better. Nothing tells me that the quarterback is bad and is never going to work if he's throwing the ball 30 and under times a game. That is, and the only time he's throwing the ball a lot is if he's really clicking and it looks great and he's throwing for 400 and it's just that great game. And then next week he's back to throwing the ball 28 times. That to me is in current football. So we need to surround him with that and we need to take a step as a franchise. And he needs to be a quarterback. And if he sucks, live with it. Get the fuck, get rid of him. Make the cut the cord. I don't want to hear he's second. He has great talent. No, if he can't do it next year, 
We've seen so many young guys do it. Get them the fuck out of here. That's modern football. So the draft is important to build that foundation around them. But in the end, it's all Zach Wilson. Everything that we were doing offensively and defensively is to help Zach Wilson. Defensively is to get the offense off the opposing offense off the field and put the ball back in Zach Wilson's hands. Offensively is to help Zach Wilson be successful. This team lives or dies with the quarterback, like every other team, and JD needs to put a good team around him. And that's all I got to say about that, Dave. Anything else you got to add? No, not really, honestly. That was not bad. That was not bad. <laughs> I've done much worse, and AKA, that's everything else I say. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this uh, little Jets draft preview. If you're not a Jets fan, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you didn't enjoy it, your team sucks. So there's that. Um, I Again, I always appreciate everybody for listening. As always, please, please, please like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify and iTunes, spread this word of mouth and go follow us on the socials. Just go search the Alex Quest the show. It will show up. Hope everybody has a fun draft night. Be safe. Drink a lot. I, I think you could bet on draft picks. So go ahead and do that. Be a degenerate. But whatever you do, like I said, be safe. If you're going to drink, you're going to have a party. Stay the fuck home. Don't drive around. Don't get drunk and be that person that kills somebody or yourself because you decided to drive. And um, I hope everyone's team besides the Buccaneers, because fuck Tom Brady and anyone else in the AFC East has a great draft. And the Giants. Fuck the Giants, too. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good one, y'all.